then, then, then type it in and we'll... So the question that was posed is, what will happen to finches' beaks in a moist or year with a lot of rain? A moist year. All right, let's see what we came up with. Twelve responses. I know everybody's still kind of logging in. It's not ITMA, though. The, it will become softer. Science will have, oh, boy, it's been, it must be homecoming week. Those are some seriously unintelligent answers. Shorter, it will become soft, okay. Smaller and softer due to the ease in acquiring, <laughs> acquiring food. Okay. It will melt. Oh, shit. Oh, wow. All right. Um, well, smaller would be what we were looking for, right? Smaller, okay, because they don't have to be as large to break open the nuts, right? If the nuts are really hard and dry, then it's going to be harder to break them open, so the beak stenches we learned will become a little bit bigger. What? I don't know where that even came from. Uh, <laughs> we're just going to move on. All right. So fossil evidence, this is, this is the next step. So far we've been talking about living examples of evolution. Now we need to look at some of the fossils that we've found. So fossils are the remains and traces of past life or any other direct evidence of past life, such as traits, footprints, or preserved droppings. Has anybody seen the dinosaur footprints out west? Yeah, up the side of the Red Rock. Um, what are some other fossils that you guys have seen? Dinosaur poo poo, okay. Anything else? Petoskey stones, hexagaria, right? What? Ants? Oh, you've seen the fossilized ants? Oh, the amber, I got gotcha. you. Okay, amber, amber fossils, very good, okay. Like in Jurassic Park, yes. Okay, so, oh, yes, we should just watch Jurassic No, no. We <laughs> so, not really, was it? Kind of. So, if you think about all the fossils, why will we never find a, fo a fossil of like a dinosaur in Michigan? Because why? Because we're not cool. Why? Okay, well, we had ice, right? But... But that's not why we don't really find the dinosaur fossils. What passed through Michigan? The, the glacier, right? And when that glacier passed through, it took any fossil record that was here and pushed it away from us, right? So now we're actually older where we're at than dinosaurs. We're down to the Davinian period here in Michigan. That's why we find all this fossilized coral, hexagaria, that's Petoskey stones. Um, so really, we're older than dinosaurs, so we're a lot cooler in a way. Right? So fossils... Oh, yeah, all right. What's cooler? What coral? What about horn coral? That's pretty cool, right? Well, no, okay, all right. So fossils are, are going to have the, the fossil record, sorry, is the history of life from our past. So if I reference the fossil record, I'm obviously talking about the fossil record of evolution. So they document a succession of life forms from the simple to the more complex. So the digger, we, the digger, the deeper we dig in the earth, it's been a weekend. My words are going to be jumbled today, I promise. So the deeper we dig in the planet, the older things get. And the deeper we get, what happens? Things get more what? Simple. Simple. Okay? So if I missed something, obviously, I heard a oh, like something bad happened. But the deeper we dig in the earth, we find simpler and simpler organisms, all the way down to trilobites. Okay? And... Why don't we find too many things simpler than trilobites in the fossil record? Let me go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask a question for that. Why don't we find things simpler than trilobites? Those are simple, sing not single-celled, but multi-celled shelled organisms. Why don't we find things simpler than that? Kind of give you a hint in there if you were listening. 
Why don't we find things simpler than a trilobite? Three responses. Did you guys have a good weekend? Why did they cancel the Power Puff game? Will people melt now or what? Oh, okay. All the makeup would run. Oh, I see. Okay, I got you. I hear you. I hear you. Oh. The, oh. Eight responses. I know there were at least 14 of you out there before. Come on now. Be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. Three, two, one. It's okay. The conditions to make them involve having a hard shell. Very good. Okay. The exoskeleton or skeleton. Okay. Okay, so the best the best answer is there they lack the hard exoskeleton, right? Um this was a, at a time where skeletons didn't even exist. So we're talking the exo outer chitin skeleton uh or keratin. So things like a jellyfish very seldom will make a good fossil. Uh, there were a lot more organisms in the Precambrian period than were in the Cambrian, but there's no real fossil record of them because they don't make fossils. They basically are a gelatinous material or very soft tissue. Okay, it'd be like us. We are not going to. You're not going to see a, a skeleton of mucus, right? That doesn't. That, and that'd be about the equivalent of some of these organisms. So sometimes we find like algae balls. Uh, down the very, you know, the, you find a pile of fossilized phytoplankton or uh, zooplankton, and the, they will do that. They will make those large fossils. Anybody ever see those fossil balls in the um, museums? They're used, there's usually one in every museum, a giant fossil ball sitting there. And you walk up and you go, what is that? And then you got to read, and you're like, oh, it's a fossilized community of phytoplankton. So you got to read. Yeah, that's where you lose most people, right? If it's not a... If it's not like a stegosaurus and you see a big big rock and a plaque next to it where there's a paragraph, people usually just walk back and go, oh, nice, nice giant rock. And <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. I know. That's, that's what happens. I know. So, oh, that's how, that's, that's, yeah. The millennials, right? Should we blame them? No. At any rate. So this is going to document a succession of life forms from, sim from simple to the more complex. Uh, sometimes the fossil record is complete enough to show descent from an ancestor. Usually it is not. Transitional fossils are a common ancestor for two different groups of organisms, and they allow us to trace the descent of organisms and how they might have evolved. Why will we never find a complete fossil record? Tell me. Why will we never find a complete fossil record? Two responses. Come on, now. Type your time. I thought of a cool project if anybody still needs one. Okay. Let's see what we came up with. Okay. Not all organisms make fossil. Right. Too many disturbances, natural events. So a lot of parts of the right answer will say that. So the conditions that 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 are going to make a fossil are very rare. We're talking like getting buried in sediment, 
right? That doesn't happen all the time. Just how often do you experience a mass flood where your neighbors get buried? Um, not very often. Um, well, every it happens every weekend. Okay, you, you need to move. Um, like, like the people that stayed in New Orleans, like, hey, let's stay here. That was a good experience. Let's do that again. Um, so, all right, there's one. What use? And the other thing is this: what usually happens to things when they die? We've all seen the Discovery Channel. Yeah, they're like food, right, for other organisms, right? I've never seen a lion, you know, eat the zebra and be like, oh, let's leave this right here because it's going to make a cool fossil. Right? That doesn't happen. It's going to be cool in a million years, guys. Just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. Let's bury it in sand. <laughs> so that doesn't happen. Uh, we know that. Uh, so this is like, I, I can't even have this conversation with half the human population because they don't even understand how fossils made, number one. And number two, um, they won't even have a discussion with me. But I, everybody wants to have the evolution discussion with the biologist. And, and I live up north, so I have it a lot. Um, but my only answer I can give them is you're never going to find the missing link. Because they always say, what about the missing link? I say, well, if you knew anything about a fossil, you know it's very unlikely. And then they go, ah, I knew it was wrong. I go, no, that's not quite what I mean. I mean, you're even more not thinking about this than you should be, but I don't know how to nicely say that to you and not offend you. So I do. I say, okay, I nod and say, it's nice talking to you, Joe. Um, see you later. I don't know, because that's like, um, I am very nice when I talk to people about it, but I don't know how to approach a non-scientist about this topic. So I only talk about it in the science field. I just don't. And so in this class, I don't talk about beliefs or anything, but... Just so you understand, the conditions to make a fossil are so extremely rare, and usually things die and decompose. You are not going to find a fossil record of anything. Of, that means you'd have every single step of the evolution. It's not going to happen. Okay? Um, you look here. This is what's known as an index fossil, where you see these transitional fossils between one organism type and another. And you don't see every little step along the way, do you? And what I want you to visually grab here is you just, you just, you notice small differences between the species types. In this case, the eye position is moving uh, towards the front as this species becomes more and more predatory, okay? Uh, obviously, a salamander is not as predatory as, let's say, a fish, right? We all kind of can conceptually understand that. But when we look at transitional fossils, it is an index fossil giving us that in-between stage. Here is another example of the eye position moving in an index fossil. Uh, the whale is kind of a cool one because it was thought to have started to evolve onto land and it developed hip bones and actually a small femur structure. And then, for some reason, environmental conditions weren't favorable to it on land, so it kind of went back into the water. Um, that's what the fossil record shows. Okay. Do I have every missing link along the way? No, it's a whale, man. Right? <laughs> like, they sink to the bottom of the ocean and get ate by other fish when they die. Right? And they, the whale is the other one that everybody's like, you told me a whale came out of land. Well, yeah, according to the fossil record, that's what it shows, but I understand there's a lot of missing links. And they're like, yeah, like completely. And I say, yeah, when you look at that, yes, it is ridiculous to look at that and draw those conclusions until you look at the structure and the bone structure. And then you start to realize that they are related. Foot bones? Hip bones? They do have a hip. Yep, and they do have the remnants. It's not functional. It's like our, our uh, appendix for them now. It doesn't function at all. Um, it'd be like our tail. Okay. Yeah. We, do have, we did have a tail in the womb. We did have a tail in the womb, every one of us. Yep. No, in the moon? No, yes. You go to the moon and you grow a tail. That's the, didn't you know? Um, one giant tail for, yes, okay. What foot did Neil Armstrong step on the moon does left? I learned that last week, and that was, I don't know why that popped in my head. Yeah, that's going to save the world someday, right there, that piece of knowledge. That, knowing that Neil Armstrong put his left foot on the moon is going to cure cancer. So small, yeah. You guys, you guys were, I can't believe you missed that one. So biogeographical evidence, you guys. Uh, this is looking at living 
things and where they are located, obviously. But biogeography is the study of the range and distribution of plants and animals throughout the world. And I, I will tell you right now, I don't even need to look at the fossil record to see evidence of evolution. All I need to do is look at living things and their DNA, okay, and where they are at on the planet today. Um, the fossil record only supports that, which we already know by looking at living things. So biogeographical bio distributions are consistent with the hypothesis that related forms of life evolved in one local and then spread to uh, accessible regions. Now, a different mix of plants and animals would be expected whenever geography separates continents, islands, seas, etc. So humans, we can see this in our evolution, right? So a long time ago, this thing called the African Divide, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that area of the world, separated two populations of humans. And when I say populations, I mean lots of different populations, but it basically separated them into a jungle side, arboreal, and a plain side. So the ones stuck on the plain side from the divide were left to walk upright and reach up and grab food out of branches of trees, climb and hide from predators, things like that when they could, but led to walking bipedally. That's human evolution. Okay, general. That's a very general explanation of human evolution. The other ones were left in the trees. Now, don't ever think I've told you that humans came from chimpanzees or anything like that. Those would be separate lineages that evolved on their own, but from a common ancestor. Do they know that common ancestor? No, that fossil is missing. Will it be found? More than probably not. Okay? So that's what I tell everybody. It's not that we came from a monkey or a chimpanzee. Uh, but Related distantly, yes, to a common ancestor that is unknown. Okay? I think that's a cool thing about science. You can still find things out. They could find it tomorrow. Who knows? Have they found a lot of different versions of them that are kind of along the way, like hominids and Lucy? We've all heard of these, right? Those early hominids, yes. Were there a few scientists that fudged some data in the past? Yes. yes. Some combined like gorilla bones and with a few different mixtures of some fossils and tried to come up with their own version. But I am here to tell you those have been taken out of the equation. Okay? Those are yeah, those are not even looked at, but they are generally because of a few have given the real science a bad reputation. But those are not to be used as evidence against the theory because they those aren't even used in your, you won't find them in your book is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay. Although I, I do have that discussion a lot too. So looking at anatomical evidence, vertebrae forelimbs, we all have a forearm, right? All vertebrates do. They are homologous structures. This means that they did come from a common ancestor. So they all contain the same sets of organized bones in a similar way, yet they are modified extensively to meet various adaptive needs. Now Darwin interpreted this as support for a hypothesis of common descent. So Darwin thought that you could look at the fossil evidence, but you could also look at what existed today and make connections from that. This also led to the embryology studies where you had the embryological development, and we use that as evidence as well as evolution, with evolution. And all vertebrae embryos do have a post, uh, post-anal tail and uh, paired pharyngeal or gill pouches. So am I telling you we all have gill pouches in the womb? The answer is yes. Just really creepy. I thought that one that upsets me more than the tail. <laughs> yeah, but really, I mean, if we had a, if everything must have evolved from the water, right? And so it only makes sense that our history is stems from the water. Uh oh, come on, machine work. Did I go too fast for you? Okay. So looking at homologous structures, these are uh, anatomical, anatomically sorry, similar because they are inherited from a common ancestor. They may be functionally similar or not. What do I mean by functionally similar? I mean like the forelimbs of a human being compared to the forelimbs of a penguin. We use them differently, right? But they all have the same bones structurally. If I compare my arm 
to a bat's wing, very different, yet extremely similar. What part, I'm going really, to really make you think, what part, which bone, which set of bones, is the most differentiated in the forelimbs of vertebrae? Which set of bones? There are, there are essentially four different bones here I'm thinking of. So which one? I give you a hint. It's the one that interacts with the environment the most. Final answer in five, four, three, two, one. Phalanges, yeah, you guys remembered. Phalanges. 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 The hand. Radius, no. Ooh, metacarpals, I like that. That's really, that's really technical. I just like the word phalange, it sounds fun. <laughs> so, you guys, the phalanges, they are the ones that interact with the environment. They're the ones that natural selection is going to act on the most. They are the most specialized. Therefore, they are the ones that we have the most difference from vertebrae to vertebrae in. Now, if I look at analogous structures, these are going to serve the same function but are not uh, constructed similarly, and they do not share a common ancestor. This would be like, actually, why don't you guys draw, let's, let's have fun a little bit here. Oops, I did the wrong clip. That might actually help. That might actually help. I don't want to, you don't want to do that. Hold on, no. Oh, I keep hitting ask again. Shoot, shoot, darn. All right, here. Draw an analogous structure. Draw two organisms with an analogous structure, side by side. See what you guys come up with. Well, see if I can draw one. Just to oh. My pen's not working. Oh my goodness, my pen's being screwy. what that is. That's a that's something. <laughs> it's a bee and a butterfly. It's a bee and a butterfly. It's a the more detail I put in here. <laughs> this is not happening, is it? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to circle it. So the, this is, uh, I guess, a bat. Um, <laughs> this is an insect. Okay. So my insect... And my bat both have what? Wings, right? Okay. But they do not share a common ancestor. I don't think anyway. Um, share a common ancestor unless you go way back. Oh, hand and feet. Yeah. Okay. Getting. Let's see what we have here. Oh, there we go. Look at the penguin. Yeah. 
I like it. Oh, very good. Someone was right there with me. Look at that. I, I don't know. Who drew Anna and Joe? Okay. Oh, oh, sorry. I'll be in a bird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa, what's going on there? All right. I'm going to have to edit this. Okay. Um, okay. Butt flies, what? Bat and what? Oh, butterflies. <laughs> You forgot your er. All right. So at any rate, I don't know if that I don't know if that was an AP question. We'll have to adjust that one. All right. Yeah. I don't know. So at any rate, an analogous structure does not have a common ancestor, obviously. So. Then there's this other thing called a vestigial structure. That's like those hip bones in that whale that don't really serve a purpose anymore, but are from their evolutionary past. So it's a fully developed anatomical structure in one group of organisms, reduced or obsolete function in similar groups. So our appendix is, it used to serve as a ruminant. Do you guys know what a ruminant is? Uh, cows have them, horses have them, deer have them. It basically is an organism that houses bacteria, mold, fungus, viruses to break down organic plant material, right? So we used to have a ruminant that would do this for us. We don't anymore because obviously we started eating more and more protein, meat, right? We have now have canines. Um, so you look at our other arboreal ancestors, they do have a functional ruminant because they are eating primarily plant life, okay? So some organisms do have a functional appendix. Every now and then, ours does start to grow stuff. Is that a good thing? No, it's called appendicitis, right? And then if you let it just keep growing, bacteria will continue to grow and expand that. Gases will be made, right? We've got fermentation, CO2. That's not good because then it can go kablooey, right? And that's not good. Nobody wants their, their poop exposed to the inside of their abdominal cavity, right? That's essentially what that would be. Okay? It's a bad deal. What? I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, well, if you get a bacterial infection and that your body doesn't fight off and it, it's in your appendix, it will just grow and grow. Two become four, four become a million after, you know, a day. So. Yeah, it got, it got straight, so you guys understand, right? Okay. That's not good. So... And, you know, I used to worry about my appendix. I was like, oh, it must, you know, maybe it's my appendix. But, and then I realized, I was like, oh, that's not going to happen. I'll be all right. And if it does, I'll, I'll go to the hospital and take it out. It, your appendix is in your lower right side, okay? Um, so if, if you think it's your appendix and it's your left lower side, that's not it, okay? All right, that's something else. All right, every, every year a student says, I think my appendix is, you know, and, I, and then they're like over here. I'm like, no, that's not your appendix. So we talked a little bit. Oh, these are way better drawings than mine. Okay, maybe. So here we have a whale. Look at the whale. That's pretty cool. Anybody ever uh, grabbed a hold and held a dolphin slipper? Yeah? What are you feeling there? Have you, have you felt the bumps? So inside of a dolphin slipper is a hand kind of creepy. My, my sister is a, well, she's not anymore. She used to be a dolphin trainer for 15 years. And we used to go and play with the dolphins. And you grab their hand, you can feel her. they got fingers in there. There's a whole hand in there. It's creepy. And, and you're like, oh, that's weird. Because the fish doesn't have this, right? This is like unique to them. And so there's a whole hand, a set of phalanges in there. Uh, so they even have this in common with us. So no matter what you are, you're going to have certain things in common. You're going to have a humerus. Everybody laugh. That's, that's funny, right? Okay. And then you're going to have the radius and the ulna. How do you tell the radius from the ulna? Give me a th go thumbs up, everybody, real quick. Now, just stick your hands out and go like this. Your radius is radiating. Keep your pinky finger kind of as the axis of rotation. Your thumb right now is, uh, is right next to your radius here and it radiates around your ulna. That's why it's called the radius, okay? This is a little anatomy lesson here. Okay, so 
that radius actually radiates around your, your ulna. And that's how you can remember it. The radius is in line with your thumb, okay? I used to have a hard time remembering that, and then I was like, oh, that makes sense. It radiates. So. All right. So anywhere you look here, you can see that this, this purple bone in line with the thumb, not much of a thumb in a horse, I know. Very specialized phalanges in a horse. It's kind of weird to even think about it, okay? I don't even think of these as phalanges, and I have horses, but they are. Um, in our... Our human definitely on the thumb. It's right there. And even in our whale. Yeah, it's really hard to tell, you know, if a whale is, like, waving at you and giving you a thumbs up or, like, mad at you and, you know, giving you the, you know. <laughs> it's all the same. They're just like. <laughs> you ever see, like a, like, a whale at Disney World? They might be happy or they might be like, hey, I don't like you. Yes. They're showing you the nail that grows the longest. Right? All right? Okay. So if we take a look at fetal development, you guys will be doing an experiment on this later. Okay? You guys will actually be candling eggs and you'll be running one of your inquiry based labs on duck eggs. So ethically. 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 Okay, ethically. I cannot let you do anything that will harm them, we'll say that. Yeah, we can take ducks home. So as we look at the development of different vertebrae, it doesn't matter what type it is, they all develop in a very similar fashion. Okay? Doesn't matter if you're if you're a fish, a salamander, a tortoise, uh looks like what is it? We got a little tortoise. That's cool looking. Who had a tortoise? Priestley does. Look at it, that's what he looked like, a little baby tortoise. But you're going to see this, you guys, when we do the duck uh, candling. They develop in the exact same way we do. A lot smaller, right? A lot faster. But the same developmental order is, is there in all vertebrae. Okay? They, they have a set of Hox genes, if you remember that from biotech, if you have biotech. If you didn't, we're going to learn more about it. But that basically tells you where your head, your tail, and your um, um, spine are going to be. So biochemical evidence, it's not just anatomy, it's not just biogeography, it's not just fossil, it's biochemical as well. All living things, this is where, I, this is like the selling factor for me, DNA evidence, right? Um, all living organisms use the same basic biochemical molecules. We all utilize the same DNA triplet code. We all use those same 20 amino acids to make our proteins. Now, DNA-based sequence, uh, sequence differences are what make us different. The order of amino acids changes that primary structure of a protein and changes the structure. Now, when very similar, it suggests a recent common descent. And when more different, it suggests a more an uh, ancient common descent. So uh, we can actually figure out how long ago races of people separated from each other into different continents based on their genetic sequence. So what, bio, what uh, biologists can do in biotech labs is they can take, let's say, the DNA of an African person, the DNA of an Asian person, the DNA of a uh, Native American, the DNA of a Filipino, the DNA of uh, a Norwegian, and when they look at them, they can look at the differences and they can tell how long ago they diverged without even looking at the fossil record. The reason they can do that is DNA mutates at a very predictable rate. We don't choose where it mutates, but it does. It is very predictable as how often it mutates. Because of that, we can put a time clock to it, and we can actually backtrack how long ago the different races of people diverged. Now, just saying that might not mean anything until you look at a fossil record which matches the prediction perfectly. So now I can not only date things with chemicals and living organisms, but if I compare them to the actual index fossils, they match. So that even more verifies the whole subject. Okay? That's the kind of the selling factor for me when you can actually look at DNA evidence and see how things have evolved and changed. And that's just within our own species. Am I missing something, guys? It must be. Okay. 
So this is where this whole biological um, and biochemical difference comes in, looking at this actual protein structure. And this is a graph of just looking at uh, one cytochrome protein. So if you look at this, this is, uh, this is the cytochrome mapped out by the differences of these organisms to see how related they are to us. Now, we aren't that uh, closely related to a moth as we are a fish, more so related to a turtle. I kind of like the fact that I'm more related to a turtle than a fish. It's kind of cool. That means I have a chance of becoming a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, minus the teenage part, right, because I'm too old for that now. Um, so then ducks, we're more, I'd rather be more related to a turtle, but we are more related to a, a duck. Pig, I just wreck things. Right there. Then obviously our monkey ancestors, right? All right. But this is looking at the differences of the amino acid sequence of one protein, a cytokine. What now? Question? No? Joke? I like jokes. Tell me one. Not appropriate? It's about biology? Tell it to me. It'll be on YouTube later. We'll <laughs> no? Okay. All right, guys. So that's the end of notes. Tomorrow, 